What you're about to see is my interview on December 29th, 2021 with Dina Krasich and uh, veteran Grigo, the team who created Pavilion, and which is part of the Through the Mesh exhibition. Uh, we go through uh, the origins of Pavilion, uh, decentralized networks, um, decentralized communities versus the blockchain, and um, end up with an unnecessarily large question. So I hope you enjoy it. Thanks so much. Okay. Good morning or good whatever it is from where you're at. Um, I'm Patrick Lichty and this is uh, one of our later interviews for the Through the Mesh, Mesh exhibition at um, neem.org. Um, this is um, Dina Krasic and Veteran Gligo from um, Hack Lab, the Pavilion team. And um, one of the reasons for my putting the um, Pavilion in the show was that it's a ostensibly a gallery that uh, um, occupies space on the on the dark web. And um, as um, culture in the culture in, across meshes and borders and between info spaces and uh, biopolitical spaces expands. Um, I feel that um, every every part of the web is, I mean, every part of the internet is going to be, and all the all the networks um, are going to be um, more and more critical as things go forward. So as we as as we go forward, and as uh, I see that uh, this um, this team has a, a really long resume, so as opposed to me trying to pick and choose things I think I would like for the two of you. So uh, Dina Krasic and uh, Veteran Grigo. Hey, Patrick, uh, thanks for the introduction. And uh, may maybe I start and then uh, Veteran can. Uh, yeah, I mean, well, finish. I mean, give, give a, uh, could you give, give a, just a brief overview of, um, you know, who you are and what you're, you know, what you've done and things like that, both of you, and then let's go into Pavilion. So um, yeah, my name is Dina, and I'm uh, the uh, I'm an artist uh, first and foremost, and uh, after that I'm an art director of Formatse Artist Organization, uh, which deals with uh, digital collectivity, digital art, and uh, uh, artistic researches. And I'm also a member of uh, Hack Club Zero uh, One. Uh, project and this is a veterans domain so uh, sometimes I say I'm an artist uh, interested in computers and veteran is a, a computer guy interested in art so uh, we uh, kind of uh, we collaborate and uh, contribute to each other's projects I also we together uh, founded the uh, FUBAR Glitch Art Festival uh, and the Pavilion Project, which is a network uh, project for art and the artists. So this is just a short uh, overview of what we do. It's mostly digital art based work, uh, decentralization, uh, inclusion, uh, large scale, large scale collaborations uh, and similar. So Vedran, maybe you can. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, hi, uh, my name is Vedran Gligo. Uh, I am. I've only been an artist for the past f five or six years or so. Before that, uh, I was just a Linux geek person who ran this hackerspace uh, in Zagreb. Uh, that's called Hacklab Zero One, and uh, uh, from like that. 10-ish, 7-ish years ago, I worked with Dina in Format C, where uh, I'm the person interested in art, and she tells us uh, what needs to be done. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. So, that's, uh, so, like, I mostly, like, outside of my art practice, uh, I do open source software stuff. I, like, promote the use of open source software in, like, daily, like, daily activities for just uh regular people uh, and that was most of our hack lab program until we really got into uh, digital art and like uh, critical art stuff like 10 10 ish uh, seven ish years um, ago uh, so yeah that's it that's me mostly <laughs> like that yeah yes okay uh pavilion um as we've talked about on 
on email is that this has had a lot of different um, uh, a lot of different permutations, and uh, maybe we could do a, a uh, an overview of what it is and how it's evolved. So uh, Pavilion is uh, basically it's a way of thinking in a way. So it's it is a project and it does have uh, its own materiality, but it's basically. Um, an idea about artists, uh, digital artists showing their work on the network outside of established infrastructures and commercial websites. So this is one aspect of Pavilion. The other identity or aspect of Pavilion is that it's an educational project that we endeavored on ourselves. And we also are including uh, other people and artists. And it's also an activist project. So uh, there's different, there are different views of what Pavilion is giving on the moment. So it basically started when in 2015, uh, I had a residency at the GMK gallery with the net.cube uh, curators collective. And I realized that as an artist, I don't know how to set up a web-based piece without using the internet, uh, without using Tumblr or any other microblogging service, uh, which was freely available. And uh, then Vedran and I figured out that there is there might be a need uh, also for us and for other artists to uh, be able to do this. Of course, Vedran knew how it can be done because uh, uh, he's a Linux uh, admin and systems administrator. Uh, so we, we tried to figure out a way which is uh, friendly towards uh, creators, but not also too easy because we're what Pavilion is not, it's not a service. So it's not something that uh, you can kind of without thinking, you can use without thinking because uh, it's it's specifically built, the process of Pavilion is built that you, uh, so that you learn stuff in the process and that you create something new. So every iteration of Pavilion is also new for us. So we are actually trying to learn through different uh, versions of the install. So it started as a local server in the gallery space because I didn't want my work to go through uh, multiple continents and then come back to the gallery. I just wanted to show my work. Um, then we applied to the Schlosspost web residencies uh, in 2016. And uh, it was about uh, on the topic of decentralization of internet art, uh, which was really, uh, really important topic for us. Then we, I think this is really fun. We did a test run of Pavilion while having a Raspberry Pi. Sorry, so this is a Raspberry Pi. Uh, so, but having a Raspberry Pi uh, plugged into a battery and we did an exhibition on a bus that was driving from Osijek to Zagreb. So we connected the Raspberry to the public Wi-Fi on the bus and it was serving a darknet exhibition at the time, which was part of the Academy Schloss Solitude uh, development program. So after that, we started with gallery setups and not just this, but uh, those were some of the first ones. Uh, so we participated in different gallery exhibitions in different ways. And uh, I have to mention, and this might be important that Vedran talks about a bit later, that Vedran does custom network design for mm. this every specific gallery uh, install. And this is really important because without this uh, aspect we wouldn't be able to to kind of to create this and every exhibition would be the same so having a linux administrator uh, and a network mm -hmm. admin uh, on your team is uh, really beneficial for the project it's the is the central aspect of the project and uh, this is also something that uh, galleries that we normally work with in uh, Croatia, they're not necessarily used to having uh, this uh, uh, hybrid role of an artist who is 
basically a network designer, but also a visual artist. And then we're kind we're always struggling with uh, the definition of our roles. So we participated in the Artist is Online exhibition and then Dada Club Online. Uh, and uh, we also had uh, where we had performances, real time performances on the darknet. Um, then we shown an open repo in in the Museum of Fine Arts in uh, in Osijek, and this was also an important part. Like we put an open repo yeah. where you can participate from the darknet. So yeah. it was really a kind of a special moment for us because the curators gave us so much trust that we would put a screen where non-curated content is being displayed in real time in the center of the museum. So yeah, it's Pavilion is also activist in this uh, way that we, we ask for more space and more trust for the artists in, in a way. Uh, then we started participating in the wrong uh, new digital art Biennale. Uh, I think we've been participating since 2017. Oh no, even earlier, but this is with P mm. we started joining with Pavilion. And uh, since then, we are trying to organize a decentralized darknet pavilion for creation art, art mm. arts and artists and uh, collectives. So even this year, we are still in production with some, but we will have uh, different devices set up uh, over Croatia and they will have they will hold different collections of artwork and they will be part of the wrong with us. So. Uh, I think it's important to mention that in the process of working uh, with the pavilion on the darknet, we realized there is uh, one other mode of uh, pavilion, which is this, uh, it's a wireless uh, network access, local mm -hmm. network access that is really important and has proven to be really important also during the pandemic. And we've been using this mode a lot. So technically we would set up the Raspberry Pi in a physical location. And uh, then we would not serve it over the darknet to, a, uh, to our distributed uh, international community, mm -hmm. but we would serve it locally to the local community via uh, Wi-Fi. And this mm -hmm. provided to be a very useful uh, and very uh, fruitful uh, way to communicate network art. And I think it's also interesting for people and also may maybe Vedran can mention a bit more about uh, the way that this works and uh, because we use the most commercial part of, uh, yeah, of the browser universe to set up uh, this work. And so, yeah, we've been in different events. I'm not gonna, list them now. Maybe we can uh, share the presentation with the interview. We have it uh, online. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a lot of fun with different events, different situations, and we mm -hmm. learn a lot every time. And in um, 2020, with the pandemic, we really started uh, to focus more on these uh, Wi-Fi exhibitions uh, because they can be done depending on the equipment that you need or want to use. They can be done in big spaces, in public spaces. Uh, it it uh, takes away the focus from the physicality of the location of the device, but mm -hmm. uh, it uh, kind of focuses uh, the viewers on uh, physical locations in the public space. So I think this is an interesting way of communication. Um, it's a bit harder uh, if you're mm -hmm. if you have this like uh, mm -hmm. pop up um, uh, Wi-Fi uh, network where nobody knows that there's an exhibition there but i think it's also one of the strengths of pavilion that it uh, it shows up as an open wi-fi so people sometimes we joke it's like a honeypot uh, for people who want to connect to get free internet and then they get art they see yeah. an art piece after connecting to free wi-fi and they they can't go to the internet the only thing they can do is to see the to yeah, scroll through the exhibition it's, it's, and it's the work. Benevolent, it's benevolent trolling. 
yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but we serve them something that we really trust is a really important date and everybody should see. Yeah. Yeah. So, Vedran, do you, would you like to uh, did mention something that I'm, I'm sure missed like a lot of stuff? And uh, I think this uh, technical part is really important. So about Pavilion, like what is Pavilion uh, technically? I mean, technically, it's just a bunch of bash scripts, right? <laughs> if you want to get technical about it, but uh, yeah, I mean, we can go into it. So, so Pavilion is basically like a bunch of config files and scripts I put together that's hosted uh, on 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 GitLab right now. But soon it will have like mirrors uh, with some uh, with actually some some institutions and some independent. Uh, organizations because we're even like we're thinking of like what happens if GitLab uh, decides to charge for mm -hmm. its service which it might it it may not but it's like right now it's free so they did have this fallout thing where they decided to uh, go through everybody's data but then like like there was an uproar and like the community said hey we're just going to stop using you if you do this and then they stopped and like GitHub is now owned by Microsoft and that's mm -hmm. also changing so like who knows what's going to happen with these services like that are free and super friendly to users now but like what's what's going to happen in a year or or like in 10 years we have no idea so we're like planning to decentralize this even further and we will have with like this git repo in several places so pretty much the museum any, of contemporary art in Zagreb also what it does is basically uh, anybody with just a little bit of knowledge or free time because it's really documented for like so like that's so one of our goals with the project is to actually teach artists who who uh, distribute their art in in through mo through social media mostly and that's like digital artists often do that today outside of the gallery and outside of this physical world and they have very little or no knowledge about how the infrastructure actually works so what we do is run workshops uh, and I mean, uh, we used to before COVID anyway, now we, uh, like we try to do it online, but it's not as feasible because you need the physical device in your hand in order to, to, uh, to figure it out. And what we do is run workshops to explain how the internet infrastructure works uh, to like anybody who is willing to listen. So, um, so pretty much anybody can, can come in and they can just install the software onto their Raspberry Pi and they can run their own uh, their own gallery through like through either tor uh, or uh, this local version which we've been using more and more lately because like tor is just like i mean first of all it's super slow and second the people seem to have like like normal people seem to have a bit of trouble uh, to like uh, like understanding like why they need to download the browser and then they need to connect to it and like why are we doing all this so it, i mean when we do physical shows it makes much more sense for for them to be uh, like it is uh, in in Nimi right now, so like it's like just a public Wi-Fi people can connect to, and then they can see whatever we decide to show them there. Uh, and uh, like the tour part is more meant to be used by just like random people who want to uh, to host their websites in like some weird places. I mean that was the, like my uh, like you said benevolent trolling idea. Uh, behind pavilion was actually so so let's do this so i mean tor we're like we're actually using tor not because we want to use it but because like tor has this cool feature of being able to punch through uh, f through firewalls by default so you don't really so i mean you have to set it up in order to serve websites but then once you do that you get this huge ass onion domain uh, that's now like 256 characters long <laughs> and they, yeah or something like that and they're like like you get this and then I mean you don't really need to know how anything works it just works like you connect the device to the to any sort of internet and then it's hosted you don't need to have anything you don't even know I mean you don't even need to know how to how to do any of it so my idea behind this was hey let's get this like silly internet network art that nobody really takes seriously or like if they do there's a, like a really small small percentage of of institutions who take this type of uh of art seriously and like let's make them host exhibitions without them even knowing that they're posting it so you could totally take take a pavilion device put put on some of your art and like go to any to to any museum that has public wi-fi connect to their network 
and uh, you are serving your uh, your website from from that physical space and then and they don't need to know that uh, that you're doing it right so yeah that's that's what so but in the things turned uh, like the way things turned out now is that we're more of an institution who are who is doing this like non guerrilla no trolling we're taking it really seriously but we are yet to reach uh, some like actions uh, in in some festivals so you can totally mm. do a, like go to an art festival and not apply and then host and then host it there and say that it's there and you can even walk around with some art in your bag and like walk around and and and, and people can connect to it and uh, and and see that it is there so yeah that was my uh, like point of inspiration for for doing something like this yeah mm. okay yeah. bravo <laughs> <laughs> so i mean that's two things is that one of the things that i was really interested in pavilion is the idea of um because of the fact that while i was living in the uae um yeah i had seen a number of countries in let's just say in the eastern hemisphere preparing to create uh, national in, uh, intranets and, uh, you know, basically I, I, my metaphor is the, them lifting, lifting out of the infosphere, like giant motherships and things like that. And that, and Tor being one of the things that still kind of keeps them tethered to the earth um, a bit, which I think is, uh, especially for, you know, for communities and families that have diasporas and, um, you know, and people in, in different countries. Uh, this is a very interesting uh, aspect uh, to me. And then on the other hand, the idea of even for um, um, even for things like uh, the wrong, which sort of takes the biennial uh, model and flips it upside down, the um, the notion of uh, having you know basically uh, a server a server basic grow servers and taking them into uh, institutions and having them uh, basically turned into uh, open ports, you know, for uh, democratized uh, new media work, you know, are, are the reasons why I'm, I'm interested in, 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 in this sort of thing. Uh, what are some of the most, um, you know, interesting interventions that, you know, you've, uh, that you've, you've had, you've mentioned a couple, uh, but I mean, a couple that uh, might have had some, um, you know, very, uh, can maybe some very specific outcomes that might be particularly of interest. Uh, so, Oh, by I the think... way, vet, veteran sons, I don't mean to inter interrupt, but I mean, no, no, no. I am, I mean, like with the, you know, like the idea of, um, you know, the Tornet going in, you know, punching into, uh, you know, the uh, punching into um, uh, national um, intranets and that sort of thing. Number one, is that correct? And then number two is the, you're also talking about Tor versus, are there, how many sorts of flavors of Darknet are there? Well, I, I mean, Tor, so basically Tor is, I mean, is the darknet. There's a bunch of networks around that are also like not indexed and not, but, mm. but yeah, but Tor is mostly like, like most stuff is on Tor. So Tor is like the, the 95% of it. I, I mean, as far as I know, because I'm not like a huge darknet person because I don't use it for anything else that other than our project, because it's useless. I mean, other I mean, more or art. less. Uh, because uh, I'm I'm happy, like we're privileged in a way that we don't need it, like we don't need it to get out to use the normal internet, right? So our country still uh, doesn't uh, do any any censoring on the internet. I mean, our probably will never do it because they're incompetent and they're not able to do it. <laughs> but uh, but uh, like yeah, some sometime maybe Europe will also need uh, this sort of help from like like from the outside. I'm not sure who will give it to us then because right now we are the ones helping other uh, <laughs> other countries who are like or like nation states who are not as open as uh, as as we are right now but uh, yeah so like basically uh, what uh, tor does is like yeah it punches through through anything so like so so like by default uh, so all all the traffic uh, going out to tor like pretty much looks like looks to the to the ISP like uh, you're just uh, attempting to to pull something in so like everything's yeah. like it's it's like two-way communication but to some like on a network level it looks like it's only one way so that's why they just let you do it so i mean because they need to like these firewalls usually work so that you can't like serve stuff so can't be the one who is who is offering anybody else anything but tor allows you to do that i mean there's a lot of levels of how it allows you to to do that to do that exactly and i mean right now tor, tor actually has some huge issues with people abusing it but that's that will always be uh, sure. be the case with like services like this not just abusing it for 
illegal stuff that's that's also another story but uh, also like abuse so so since it's very it's very open and anybody can so so you can just walk in and say hey i'm i'm gonna give like some of my bandwidth in order to be like a like a node in this in this network and right now there is like a, there is an, like a huge attack happening where like a third of these nodes appear to be like like malicious nodes that are used to de-anonymize users so like mm. the anonymity in tor is sort of tor is sort of in question and like yeah there are some some mechanisms that the that like the project leads can pull to to like make these uh, these like uh, these malicious servers go away but uh, it's it's currently unclear why they're not sure uh, what the intent of this attack actually is so there used to be another attack a couple of years back where they tried to steal uh, bitcoin transactions from people who are obviously using it to buy illegal stuff so it won't be a big deal that's uh, so so that's what they took it down and uh, but this year like it's this huge actor who is using a lot of resources and the, it, it's probably like a nation state or something like that because they're not seeing any patterns of them trying to steal anything they're just like taking data raking data in and probably using it to de-anonymize uh, mm. users i mean yeah that's all I mean, again, people are doing illegal stuff in it. So yeah, that's just, I mean, law enforcement is going to come in and they're going to do their job. I mean, probably sometimes they actually do their jobs and then, and then the anonymity of, of the whole network is compromised. But again, I mean, those, those people doing, doing illicit stuff is like, that's what's providing you, I mean, you anonymity because you can provide uh, because you can hide in this cloud of a bunch of people who are doing God knows what, and you can just do your thing. So if you're like, a, like a blogger in, in whichever uh, nation state, you can actually post your, some of your findings without anybody knowing who you actually are. Right. So like, I mean, of course, law enforcement is going to come in and try to and, and try to stop it. And unfortunately, one of the only ways to do this is to break the system for everybody. So mm. yeah, greedy people are going to be the death of us. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's, that's what it usually is everywhere. So in Tor uh, as well, right? Yeah. But we're trying, I want to mention one uh, important thing, and that's uh, a lot of times when we present our project, uh, I encounter people who think that Tor is illegal and mm. being in tour is illegal and then we tell them like of course if you do something illegal that's what it's illi what's mm. illegal but uh, I, I don't know if anywhere in the world uh, specifically tour has been made illegal mm. in itself so I can't speak for all countries because I don't know the legalities right now but uh, as far as I know TOR in itself is really not illegal mm. using it mm. and uh, an important part of our events is also promoting this idea that it's not the infrastructure that's illegal in itself that but what people do decide to do makes what the infrastructure is and we are actually trying to make more people use tor uh, for more than just buying drugs and yeah. uh, doing bad stuff in general so yeah if if you like patrick if you enable uh, screen sharing i can mm -hmm. screen share um, our presentation mm -hmm. uh, but it's not necessary i just wanted to mention uh, in regards to your question about some interesting events and uh, outcomes i i'm really fond of uh, all of our events so i'm not gonna go through all of them uh, Again, I mentioned quite a few. I'm just gonna uh, scroll through. Uh, so this one, one was the most important. So this is where we actually learned that there is a, a necessity in uh, 2015. Yeah, and then the Academicial Solitude has been really important for us in regards of every aspect of the project. So we got institutional support to create the project, but we had uh, full freedom in deciding what the project is. And I think this is really important and it's really specific for our context. And as Vedran mentioned, we are also living in Croatia, which is in its post-transitional state and and it's 
just becoming somehow just becoming to be regulated so there's a lot of uh, areas that are quite gray and so we have institutional funding in Croatia for our project but also get full freedom because we we actually write what we want to do and in general and when we get funding we then can pay artists uh, to um, participate mm -hmm. uh, which is, I also think it's important because we are first and foremost artists and then we are uh, org organizers and project leads. So yeah, I would maybe say that uh, I think one of the most important ones was this uh, autotrans uh, autobus uh, test that uh, Vedran and I did. I really loved this, uh, mm. uh, this session and we served it to, uh, Academy Schloss Solitude, and we collaborated with uh, the artist uh, Domenico Barra, and whose work we've shown. Um, so that one was really interesting. And this is a performance that Vedran also designed a network for. So it was a performance of reinterpreting digital images in real time via the darknet. So we were actually testing not just uh, the artist's patience, but also like what are the different modes that we can use the this darknet node for. So our raspberry was, I don't remember whether and was it in Osijek or in Zagreb? No, I think it was in the hackerspace. Uh, yeah, it was yeah, in yeah, Hack Club. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. So we had the Raspberry Pi hosted in Hack Club in Zagreb, and we had people from like five continents to mm -hmm. joining uh, to to work uh, on the uh, on the performance at real time. And we also have some people who are fully anonymized. So I don't, mm -hmm. so sometimes we don't know who has participated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, this generated a lot of like, visual art, which was unexpectedly mm -hmm. uh, layered somehow. And this is the session that we mentioned. So the image that you see on the screen in the gallery space mm -hmm. is not our work. This is an yeah. this is the open repo uh, instance where the Raspberry Pi was in the gallery space, and mm -hmm. people were uploading. We could participate uh, in this exhibition by uploading uh, via our darknet open repo, and this is the one where uh, we had this trust uh, relationship with the curators, and we had to figure out with the museum like what happens if somebody really uploads something illegal. You know, this if is I, an. If I can for a second, is uh, there there are some terms that maybe some some people on the. Uh... Uh, who might be listening to this, you know, may not understand this, uh, you know, might not be familiar with is, uh, you know, the idea of say, like, uh, say for what, what is an open repo? Uh, it's an open repository where you can open repo exhibition, where you can uh, just contribute your work and it's, uh, it's non-censored and non-curated. Mm -hmm. It's uh, just whatever you submit will get mm -hmm. uh, included in the show. And I think I've seen uh, this uh, around 2015, there was a few open repo exhibitions online. So I was really amazed by them and I also participated. So this is not related to Pavilion, but it mm -hmm. was definitely an inspiration for this type of uh, collaboration. So this is also, it's also maybe important to mention that um, Pavilion is free for everybody to use. Mm -hmm. So it's available as open source uh, code, which is also freely licensed. Uh, so you can down, anybody can download it and uh, use it. So it's somehow, it's like we're doing a franchise of, <laughs> uh. of uh, art in art of mm -hmm. an art project so anybody can be a part and it's really decentralized so we, it doesn't ping back home so we decided to do this like to mm. completely separate ourselves from uh what you do with pavilion and mm. yeah i think this is important and i think it's also a bit radical for art mm. art is somehow is focused on the like material or on or on the experience which is unique and it's uh, irreplicable 
uh, and what we are doing is completely opposite. <laughs> right, right. So, and 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 even and even the the you know the notion of um, gatekeeping and curation and you know matters of that you know the idea of of basically controlling the gate in, in any way. Yeah. And, we also built uh, like casings for uh, raspberries, so to make it more uh, closer to sculpture. So now we're uh, trying to develop the server sculpture stage of uh, uh, these servers, so we can yeah. And we also open source these uh, sculpture models, which you can three D print or build. Yeah. So I'm sharing this. So I think this is this is somehow like maybe uh, the most interesting parts for sure. for me. Sure. In some ways, one of one of my favorite texts in regards to cyber culture is uh, John Perry Barlow's uh, Dear Declaration of Independence for Cyberspace, uh, for I think 1998. And um, one thing that I think about is that I think about at the time that uh, of this year in which, uh, you know, Facebook announces itself, announces itself to try to be a, yeah, you know, an architect of the metaverse, you know, along with whoever else in the creation of meta is almost sort of the, the exact opposite side of that um, uh, kind of, I'd say, free cyber libertarian uh, impulse that, uh, that Barlow was talking about. You know, and there was basically having a free open uh, side of mind as opposed to basically having um, meta being maybe the ultimate neoliberal um you know, a uh, protocol between, you know, the, the the individual and objective reality of any sort, political, um, economic, um, material, you know, whatever, you know, for for commerce, et cetera. I'm thinking, a hey, what what I'm interested in here is the um, the notion of pavilion and institutions such as the wrong and such, which are not necessarily in um, opposition, but I'm saying that are much more in a diversification gesture of diversification as to this diversification of uh, centralization. And I'm wondering, uh, I'd like to ask you what the, um, what do you think that the kind of the future distribution of, uh, of democratization versus centralization uh, might be in the future in regards to culture and the arts? I think uh, that's, a really important question first yeah. Yeah. but uh I, i'm afraid i might not know the answer like my intuition says that uh, everything could and should be decentralized more uh, because there is physical uh, material economic uh, social ability that's mm -hmm. being built and there's a lot of capacity and uh, education is also getting better so people are uh, more uh, skillful and not not just formal also informal education and the internet has given us uh, all these resources of knowledge but what uh, the uh, what's actually happening is that everything is being amplified like, or all the data is being aggregated uh, god knows where uh, and for what purpose and um, it has come to a point where I'm I'm generalizing, of, our, of course, not everybody, but kids nowadays uh, are doing everything in the cloud and they are not really aware that these servers have structure. So mm -hmm. <laughs> there has been uh, studies about uh, like kids don't know to, how to navigate through uh, mm. a system, you know, because they just... Uh, and they just use the search function on that. Right. So I, I might not know the answer. I hope uh, everything gets a bit more decentralized because uh, if we provide uh, institutions and uh, formal regular infrastructures, if we only rely on them, then the capability, like the possibility of uh, of censorship is really high mm -hmm. and really plausible and if we find other channels and we find our own channels to our communities which are maybe physical maybe they're online maybe it's a combination mm -hmm. then we have uh, this power we are empowered to communicate which is really important and i'm also what is uh, freaky really freaky is that a lot of websites uh, uh, because they get uh, DDoSed uh, through Tor, 
and they then they block Tor. So you can't, you know, you can communicate with people, but uh, I, I also feel that uh, Tor is also uh, the usage of the Tor network is maybe becoming a bit harder mm -hmm. for uh, for some people. So. Yeah. Yeah, I think there's a tendency of people always to communicate, but also, as we mentioned, this is uh, not every organization, civil organization or um, communion is uh, is a productive one. Some are also yeah. destructive ones. Yeah. So I don't know, like the community is governing itself on this one. It's really, it's really hard to know. It could both go south and uh, uh, become a bit uh, better and dem more democratized uh, and yeah. more inclusive, less uh, gatekeeping. Mm -hmm. yeah. But uh, we're really trying to find situations where pavilion can be in a symbiosis with institutions or sure. with other programs. And we also started using it for our other projects uh, where mm -hmm. it, they're not network projects, but we started using the network for our other projects. Yeah, so it's a developing thing and we're really trying to contribute that the future of communication, digital communication in the arts and digital distribution, that it can be more distributed and decentralized. Yeah, this is our personal endeavor. Yeah. Sure. The um, a word that keeps coming up in the conversation, and I'm probably going to take a little bit of what, what we call in America, a little bit of a hitch in the turn. Uh, saying that um, saying decentralization, and of course, when we, you when you start talking about decentralization, you start talking about things like the blockchain. And but the thing is, at the moment, it seems like one of the main main functions of the blockchain is basically the aggregation and centralization of capital, versus you know versus or you know they're saying they're talking about decentralization of organizations, but you know it's often through the uh, through the aggregation of capital which is a strange you know double gesture what do you think if if this is a space that your head is in at all because i know that you're working more with networks versus you know versus um you know massively trust free uh distributed ledgers uh but i could see how one could map onto the other uh i'm wondering how you think that artists could um possibly use use the blockchain um you know, critically in a structural fashion to, you know, do work kind of like, uh, kind of like Pavilion, you know, and there have been uh, people like uh, Ruth Catlow and uh, Rhea Myers and, you know, Mar Margaret who put out the artists and using the blockchain book and that I, you know, steered people towards, but I'm just kind of wondering about you who, you know, you, know, you who are talking about decentralization, what do you think the, uh, the capacity for um, things like the blockchain might be? Uh, maybe I'll just go first shortly and then Vedran mm -hmm. probably has a lot of uh, okay. thoughts on this. Um, I just wanted to say that in 2018, we decided we have we had this um, lo logical path that we could take uh, of uh, implementing uh, oh, some type of uh, blockchain uh, onto Pavilion, but we really decided not to do this. So this was an uh, partly informed and partly intuitive decision that we like, I also, I'm still having trouble with uh, the ideas of NFTs and blockchain. Mm -hmm. I'm not opposing anybody of using it or being critical of anybody using it, but I, I, I can't get, get past uh, the point where it's, it's built for capital, for aggregating capital. And if my question, like uh, what's something being built for uh, ends up and it's, it's being built for money, I'm probably not gonna be interested in this because uh, we want Pavilion to really be a community project. So what we're interested in is not limiting or making stuff unique we're actually uh, interested in distributing work so much that the that there is no like the original object so what pavilion is is basically the complete opposite of blockchain but it's still in the decentralizing art uh, area yeah so i'm not sure we would be uh, including 
we'll I think I think I, I think I think what you articulated is exactly you know the difference between you know de decentralization by networks decentralization versus blockchain is this notion of 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 scarcity and uniqueness versus you know uh, anonymity and ultimate distribution you know what Chris Anderson calls the long tail mm -hmm. so I mean I think that's a really good articulation of yeah. of, of of that Thanks. And what Vedran mentioned, maybe Vedran, you want to continue, is that blockchain still needs the physical infrastructure. And this is something that's also been a part of a community scrutiny towards this idea and that it's using, it's heavily using the infrastructure. And what Pavilion is about, it's about the infrastructure and not what you use it for. <laughs> Yeah, right. So, I mean, my, my, my take on this is that, like, right now we are in a really, really weird uh, time for this blockchain technology. I mean, I think, personally, I think blockchain is definitely the future of uh, finance, but not right now. <laughs> that future is still in the future, in, in a not so near future, because right now it's just like, a free for all uh, speculative buying of growing more money from 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 some money that you can just waste i, I mean for the arts that's of, of course that's that's like so people will probably be able to latch on like artists who didn't have exposure who weren't exposed and weren't selling anything before nfts will definitely uh, earn some money maybe a lot of money through selling art through through one of these new platforms that are currently like so we so we saw the first wave of this there will probably be more and more waves because people are throwing money into this and they will develop systems and they have to test these systems so that's where we're basically at and but i don't see it changing so so right now it's not really changing the art market in any notable way at least that's my take on it the problem with uh, nfts and and blockchain technology i have is that like so it's like the ethos behind it is like super corporate so there mm -hmm. aren't any so if you google for open source projects that are so so systems that are built uh, so that you and me can set up their own nft market uh, mm -hmm. like by installing it on on a server somewhere these do not exist yet so there are there i mean there are some attempts of doing it but they're not they're like poorly documented they're not there there's like just some private projects uh, like somebody put up on github and you can like you, so so that's what in order for like for like true uh democratization of this like not just li like making a new like 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 a new one percent of the people who are earning money like mm -hmm. like uh, just like google uh or 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 youtube or uh, all these companies did uh, like like 20 years ago they were promising new capitalism and like everything was super just and they're not like the old ones and and now it's they're like pretty much the same or even worse <laughs> so um, like, yeah so i think right now the cryptocurrency uh, blockchain stuff is happening around people that are i mean they're just investing money i mean which is fine but yeah. they're also selling uh, like their their key selling point is like fake and not true because they're not attempting to decentralize anything they're just attempting to grow their funds right i mean right now and i mean what's going to happen in 10 15 12 well, like 25 years i mean uh, like society in general is probably going to push towards using digital currency because that's just sure. what makes sense but i'm like 100 percent sure but that's me i might be wrong that uh, none of these uh, blockchains that are going around now will be the one that people will actually be using i'm i'm like 100 percent sure about that the main blockchains uh, have serious uh, environmental concerns and like, they're like wasting serious energy, which could be used to like literally cure, ca cure cancer other than like mine, nothing, <laughs> you know? So like, it's, I mean, it's totally, and, and it's just wasting energy and it's like spending lots of electricity and it's spending lots of electricity in, in countries who are not powered by, uh, by renewables at all. And like, it's, it's, it's this huge, I mean, I'm not saying renewables are good because i mean you can have batteries which are not so renewable but that that's a whole different uh uh problem but this uh, new uh like new money isn't helping and it's supposed to be helping like that <laughs> i mean so that's one problem that it has i mean it's fixable there are there are blockchains like tezos right now that are being used for some of these nft uh, art markets that are um, like so the the price of minting like one art piece is less than 
doing a like a Facebook post about it. So like that's that's okay. That's like get that's getting somewhere. But again, I mean, art this art that's getting sold there. I mean, it's it's good for the little person selling it. But there are like billions of other little people who are not selling it, and it's not open to them because because they like hopped on at the right time. So now some people are doing something. I mean, which is fine because you know like. 95% of success is just showing up and being at the right place at the right time and that's like that's the art world but it's uh, it's still the same art world uh, that it was before it's it's just some some new players like in the field but like, like should like just to come back to 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 like to the point that we seriously need like in order like if you want to start about uh, blockchain uh, democratizing anything, we need open source projects that are powered by engineers and not by some startups who just paid some engineers to like put together something nice and then they and then they forget uh, that uh, that it exists and move on to the uh, to the next project that uh, that's going to make them money. But like we need systems like. Like we have WordPress for like powering blogs. Uh, I mean, we have Linux that are like open source systems, like countless distributions that are used to power servers and they're like there and people are, are working on it. We also need systems like this to be able to set up these markets and, and not have to build everything from uh, like from the grounds up. And like, it needs to be not built on on proprietary technology. So all these mechanisms that are used for payments, all this stuff needs to be open sourced uh, as well. And it needs to be available for everybody, not just to use to use it to pay stuff, but also build their potential businesses or like new models uh, on top of this. That's kind of what it is right now. I'm not saying like, like most ledgers are, it's very open, like technically you can, if you're an engineer, you can like, it's very simple to like build something on a, on a, on the blockchain and and the decentralized app on the Ethereum blockchain, but I think it needs to be open to people who are not engineers to be able to just hop in and run their own thing, you know. So yeah. so and it's also going to get there at one point, hopefully. I'm I'm actually amazed that it isn't there yet, you know. So yeah. like because yeah, it just makes sense that if you want people to use this, you pump money into open source projects and then people run their markets on top of your blockchain and that's how you popularize it, right? But yeah, so but, I don't know. Yeah, 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 I think that's also one part of the problem is that it's mostly private and commercial yeah. endeavors that are fueling this uh, new market yeah. and uh, I wanted to say that we're also we're uh, able to be critical of these mm -hmm. models because we are um, like it's art funding is uh, of course different in every region and every country and uh, Croatia in Croatia we are, have the privilege of uh, having uh, sometimes uh, state funding mm -hmm. um, but then I think uh, like this endeavor for that Vedran mentioned that uh, should be open towards open sourcing uh, these uh, projects to be universally accessible to non-engineers um, it, it could also be transnational you know and of a non-profit origin or a cooperative or something that's more open and uh, somehow um, justly uh, distributed inside of the structure mm -hmm. because if we're talking about decentralizing and uh, inclusivity then the structure that is organizing this uh, this uh, propagation like the uh, of the idea it also needs to be built like that so like mm -hmm. the organizations that are funding nfts are uh, infrastructurally and systematically uh non-distributed they are centralized yeah. um yeah so i'm not saying all of them are maybe there are some uh, cooperatives uh, but um, I'm not really sure. I mean, I think that it's just getting there. As Vedran mentioned, some stuff are already imaginable, but are still not here mm -hmm. uh, because simply because I think simply because there is uh, no, not a necessity for the people who have built it. They don't have the necessity to distribute it mm -hmm. and there is no pressure. And this is one of the downsides of uh, having distributed decentralized systems is that there is no central governance and uh, if there is no incentive beyond finances and money capital um then it doesn't happen sure sure i think uh one thing that i want to um maybe pose to you both and as we start winding things down 
is um, I think of a quote from Laurie Anderson's uh, 1990s uh, thing called the Puppet Motel, and it's uh, it's I, I think it's a, it's it's saying in the beginning she's saying heaven is exactly what you know you got right now, but just a whole lot better. And I think this is um, this this impulse through you know the techno libertarian sort of things. This is the next new great thing. You know, it's I mean that started in VR, then came to the web, and I mean, and I'd say probably into the early two thousands. You know, things still still seemed fairly you know utopic and that sort of thing. But when we wind up with wound up with platforms, and I mean, I'm even going to take a take, be critical of some of my own platforms, like Second Life. You know, was considering being the three D web, but it was still a centralized platform and then when uh you know you have facebook buying up you know all these other platforms and then putting it under a, 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 an umbrella like meta or you know people talking about you know the metaverse as basically an umbrella narrative as this whole set of um you know these uh, blockchain decentralized technologies basically put together as as a single umbrella what i'm wondering is uh that uh and this is Again, exactly what you're not doing, but I'm wondering that whether this is what techno capitalism keeps trying to sell the world again and again and again. And um, yeah, I'm I'm wondering where it's going to go. And I think this has been really good. And uh, I, I'd like to I'd like to thank you both.